Hey, 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 what's up, everybody? This is Lindsay Lerner, and you're listening to The Cost of the Status Quo. More people than ever are questioning why they do what they do and forging their own path. And on this show, I sit down with these entrepreneurs, trailblazers, creatives, and overall awesome beings to discuss the ideas, the opportunities, and the overall tips and tricks they're using so that the rest of us can do the same. This is The Cost of the Status Quo. Hey, 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 welcome to the cost of the status quo. Today we are here with Randy Medina, frequently found as the front man of Son of Sound, aka the band that wrote the song that's now our theme music. Shout out. And in addition to that, he can also be found educating youth, being a father, advocating for social justice, and most recently to his repertoire of skills, firefighting. As an artist, Randy and his band have shared the stage with artists like Wyclef Jean, KRS-One, Talib Kweli, Hollywood Undead, and he has had his records produced by the one and only Joe Mabbitt. Today, Randy is here to share a bit about his story and the tips and tricks that he's learned along the way. Listeners, thank you so much for listening. It would mean the world to me if you subscribed, rated, and reviewed this. It's a long way down the open road, but I've got my shoes tied on. Welcome, Randy. Thanks so much for making the time to be here. Thank you for having me, Lindsay, one of my favorite people in the entire world. That is mutual, without a doubt. So where did you grow up and what was that like? So I was born in New Bedford, Mass. It's pretty chaotic for the first couple of years. Then I landed with my dad and my stepmother, moved around a bit until I was 12, at which point we landed in Somerset, Mass. So that is where I met the rest of Son of Sound. They call it Somerset, some aren't. <laughs> So it's like that middle right. class, you know, like, you know, you go to some, some friends' houses and you're drinking Coke and eating cookies. And then, you know, some friends are rocking the, you know, Mountain Thunder and all that stuff. And we love it all. And how did you originally get into music? So it's funny because I actually wrote a, wrote a piece in high school about the moment I fell in love with music. I and mean, I was riding around in my dad's Trans Am Firebird, all white T-tops, had like the stereo equalizer. This thing was, you know. A little kid's dream. And he put in this tape, Indian Summer by Go West. And through like a lot of like, you know, chaos and turmoil that was kind of happening in my life at the time as a, as a very young kid, I heard a lot of messages and felt a lot of things in music that I really just, you know, hadn't felt before. And my dad saw it and started communicating with me through music, really. I think I got my first keyboard when I was six, moved on to trumpet, you know, marching band, jazz chorale, theater. I just wanted wanted it all. Was your dad involved in music too, or just a fan? Just a fan, a big fan, probably the biggest music influence in my life. And with all of that chaos that you had growing up, was music something that you were able to use as a distraction? Was it something that you just wanted to do because you were passionate about it? Or was it something that you found a community in? I'd say, honestly, some of all of that. I had a lot of feelings as a young kid that other kids my age probably didn't understand or things of that nature. So I kind of heard these messages in music and I was like, wait a second, that relates to me. And just being able to kind of label a feeling, a label emotion, especially at that age, that was huge. And like you said, my dad caught on to that very quickly. I started to use my own music as a way to like, all right, cool. Like I can communicate this way. It helped me. I want to help the world. I think I may be able to do it through music. It just felt pure. It felt like I could be honest with people. And they would know I was being honest. As you grow and you, you, know, you meet people and like Son of Sound, these were guys who we listened to very, very different genres of music. I was listening to like Earth, Wind & Fire and Smooth Jazz and Jay was falling asleep to Tool. Um, so, you know, but it was really cool to find this middle ground where we understood each other. And that intersect is where we really built our relationship. So I kind of find the community in that. Totally. And as you got older and as you started actually forming a band, were there any expectations that you had of what that band would be or what you would do? And were those expectations aligned with maybe what your family or their families wanted you all to be doing? Definitely not aligned with our families. So every time I was like, you know, oh, cool, like I'm doing this, I'm doing this. And it's like, yeah, yeah, but uh, what are you going to fall back on? It comes from that place of caring, like, they understood the odds of making like a career out of music compared to, you know, making a career out of being a plumber, which logically you can understand, but in your heart, you feel something else. And I think that's an important piece where people got to 
latch onto that, you know, your hero's journey, whatever it is, you have to see it through to understand it. Were you involved in any other different bands or bands in high school or school bands, church groups, anything like that? I was in, I think, nine music groups in high school. I was on the drum line. I was in jazz chorale. I was on the chorus council, whatever we called it. Just all the stuff, jazz band. Uh, we even, Jay Kohler and I had started a group. It was like called Songwriting Club. And basically we would have this big jam band style rehearsal, like after school. And for us, it was a way to bring in other kids and other musicians who didn't necessarily want to do the regimented marching band or jazz band, things like that. There's a video of me in a 2005, maybe, show choir video of me in electric blue spandex performing I'm Blue. Our choral director liked to torture us. That is a deep cut that I'm going to find. I'm going to put it in the show notes (laughs) and I'm going to enjoy every second of it. I can't have this podcast with you and and have this conversation without talking about the one and only Joe Mabbitt. Joe Mabbitt is a record producer and a studio audio engineer who has worked with many independent, like Son of Sound, and mainstream artists of the 90s, 2000s, up to recently. Some of them you may have heard of. Atmosphere, Brother Ali, Cloud Cult, The Matches, Snoop Dogg, just to name a few. We don't name drop often on here, but Joe's the man. We got to add a mint min condition. And uh, mint condition. Min condition is a powerhouse of a group from Minnesota. One of my personal favorites. Shout out to dad again. So walking into the studio and realizing he had done the horns to you know the album that I was listening to on my way there. I was like, you son of a gun. This is why I love you. This is where I'm meant to be. <laughs> <laughs> and what was it like recording with Joe? I'm fortunate enough that I got to be there for at least one of the sessions. But beyond that, what what was that like? And how did you even cross paths with him? One of the things that Son of Sound has always done that a lot of people have kind of seen as bold is we just find you know people that we want to work with. So, all right, cool. I really loved the sound of these three Atmosphere records. I really loved, you know, again, the horns and the Make Edition album, whatever it is. And as somebody, you know, I used to organize my dad's CDs as a kid, alphabetical order, and read every booklet. So I knew, you know, where it was recorded, who produced it, who wrote it. So, you know, it was like, cool, Joe Mabbitt seems to be a common denominator among a lot of these things. Let's hit him up and see if he'll record us. So our first record, which we recorded with Scott Riebling, was then sent to Joe and mixed by Joe. So we kind of built our relationship with him there. And then we, you know, sent him our stuff for our new record. And he was like... Yeah, he's like, I love it. Come on out. How have those skills and the way that you've learned how to communicate through music, how has that translated through the rest of your professional career now? Whether it was as a residential supervisor, trainer, could you share a bit more about how you got into that? So, you know, you learn skills being a musician that come in handy in any professional setting. Being a gear in the system, for some people, I know that you can relate a little bit. You kind of want to, you know, be able to control the whole situation. It's really hard to kind of sit back and be just one piece of this system. Learning that social skill uh, was huge. And then also, as the front man of Son of Sound, I kind of took on almost like this musical director position. Because I was the one sitting back being a musician, also with a front man, I kind of had this view that not many people had this perspective on what we were playing. So I was able to say like, oh, hey, you know, why don't we try this there? Why don't we do this there? And that taught me how to communicate effectively with a team, conflict resolution, all that stuff, which I did much better in the band than I did in my social life for a long time. It it connected me with people. I was able to connect with kids I was teaching. I was a choreographer for a long time. And having that connection to my community was huge because that kind of taught me how to be that mentor style, teacher style person that kind of turned into one day we were playing a show. It was a prom for Swansea Wood School. I met the kids and I was like, this is awesome. I definitely want to work here. Like I connect with these kids. I can really help them. And I started at Wood School. I was there for 10 years full-time, 
just recently moved down to part time to pursue being a firefighter. And for those listeners who don't know, could you give us a little bit more information about the school and what your role was in that realm? Swansea Wood School is a JRI program. They work with kids 12 to 22 uh, who are cognitively impaired and you know probably been in trouble. Generally, they're like getting kicked out of their school systems or things of that nature and major behavioral issues. Um, Swansea Wood School was kind of always known for taking tougher cases where, you know, other schools couldn't really handle them, which was also a big selling point for me because it was kind of like the last stop. What was it like to be balancing these different identities as this person that gets up and goes to work on this quote unquote real job that a lot of people look at as this is your career? You work with and for JRI for Swansea Wood School. And then also you are front man of Son of Sound. And at this point, this is pre having kids and, and all of that. But what was that experience like of balancing something like music that you're extremely passionate about, but also something that you're also, I think, equally as passionate about, but that's what's paying the bills. So I think the important thing there is learning, you know, when Son of Sound started, we had these, you know, dreams of being rock stars. And I mean, we were young kids and, you know, you have high expectations. And then as the years go by and you kind of find your own mission and what you're doing, we quickly realized that this was special to us because this is what kept us going. Building a community with each other. The fact that I can step in a room with those guys and almost always create something. You know, we look at each other, we know what we're doing. That musicianship and that friendship is something that you just can't find anywhere. And finding that kind of peace allows you to share it with other people and realizing like I can be passionate about something. I can do something. I can be good at something. Uh, you pass on to these kids who have no self-esteem. And one of our kind of foundation for the program is the ARC model, which is attunement, rituals and routines and competency. So, you know, those rituals and routines of, you know, going to practice writing songs, that competency of, you know, actually having a skill and that attunement which you obviously need as a musician, was very connected to what I was teaching these kids. Are there any specific lessons that working with these kids taught you that stand out? When you're working with kids, we tend to be a lot more honest. We tend to be a lot more open because they are with us. Kids are like the most honest people in the entire world. It's why I love them. Good or bad, they're going to tell you. If they think you're being a fucking asshole, that's what they're going to tell you. That raw emotion and honesty is like, I see the flaws, but at the same time, like that honesty is where I can help you. One of the keys to life is not only being honest with other people, but it's being honest with yourself and learning to effectively communicate that. It's you know huge. Are there any specific moments or lessons rather from your music career that have impacted either the work with your kids at work or just how your music career has impacted the rest of your life? As we grew as a band and musicians individually, I kind of found and was able to label what I liked about music. And again, that was that community that was being able to share that honesty with other people. Once you're able to label and look at that, translating it to the rest of your life only makes sense. Do you have any daily habits or rituals, like you mentioned earlier, that have been built up over time that allow you to navigate life how you want to? Oh, absolutely. I had watched a speech. It was like a YouTube speech. I want to say it was um, like a corporal or somebody in the uh, military talking about how you should make your bed every day and why it's important to make your bed every day. You know, and it's just like, even if you're having a bad day, you're down in the dumps. We've all had those days. Get up and make your bed that one step towards organizing, making a move, that's what it's all about. It's about making that first step. Going to the gym, teaching myself that discipline, being able to visually and physically see and feel what manifestation is. I am going to the gym. I am doing something that's good for me. And then being able to see and feel those results, mind and body. So I'm doing it with my body. I can also do it with my mind. Is that some of that tenacity that I've seen from you, that when shit hits the fan, is that how you continue to persevere? Oh, absolutely. I have definitely found a safe space in chaos 
and really being grounded and knowing what your mission is, that's what's going to keep you there. Because when everything is going crazy, you have to know where you stand because you need to know what you have to do to take that first step. I think that's part of the reason I ended up in the fire service. I recognized that. I was like, this is something that I can use. Again, a skill I've learned to help my community. It's just so interesting in general, just the different identities that we all have and the situations and circumstances in which we meet people and how we attach everything we know to that one specific thing, even though that's just a teeny tiny bit of who they actually are, especially in music. So many people see some of the artists that you know we've worked with over the years and they're like, wow, that amazing and they're on stage and it's flashy and it's rock and roll and it's it's sexy and then to dig a little bit deeper and really understand why people do what they do that common thread of community of community building of community activism and now this is essentially a third life into the next thing and so what led you to joining and being part of the fire service so Working with kids was a huge part of my life, something I started doing at about 18. However, I knew that I could, I had, again, I had skills to make a greater impact. And I kind of sat down and I, oh man, after listening to the first podcast, I realized there's a common theme here. This might be, this might be a moment, guys. Uh, I made a pros and cons list (laughs) of things that I liked about my job um, and things that I didn't like, or I thought that, you know, either basically that I could do better. And I kind of landed in the fire service. I mean, for so many reasons, you know, it's, I'm helping people in some of the worst moments of their entire lives. And to be able to stay calm and stay grounded and share that energy with them, even when it's absolute chaos, I knew that I could be an effective communicator, an effective leader within this new career. Said, son, always have a thick skin, never let a woman determine who you are. As a man, keep you cool, even when they're running out, cause no doubt, your smile's what you're really all about. And it seems just so simple and plain, but life will leave a cat forgetting his own name. Seen it send some brothers to the grave, others take it as a challenge, achieve and maintain. So through the fine rain. Another thing that I think we need more of, and that I want to bring more to light, is truly getting folks to understand all of these quote unquote successes, however you define it. I don't really care what your definition of success is. It doesn't matter. I think what matters is the fact that you did put in the effort 20 times and you fell on your face 20 times. And on the 21st time, you did it. And that's the one that you want to brag about and you want to share. But you can't leave out. (laughs) You can't leave out the rest of it, whether it's job interviews or it's projects, it's songs, whatever it is. Those are another part of the conversation that needs to be had. And along that same thread. We do ask every guest two questions. What is the worst piece of advice that you've ever gotten? And what is the best piece of advice? All right. So I like being positive. So we'll start with the best. The best piece of advice I've ever gotten was to just keep going. What makes this piece of advice so special is that it wasn't by one successful person. This was the main theme among every successful person that we came across. And it's like, believe in what you're doing and just keep going because people might not understand it now. And it's on you to kind of look at that and see why adjust. But remember, keep your mission and just keep going because eventually it all works out. You have to see it through. And the worst piece of advice I was ever given was to do something and work at something with the expectation that you're going to get something back from it. It's like, yeah, you put, put in 20 years there and, you know, maybe they'll, maybe they'll give you a promotion or, you know, maybe you'll get a pension and this and that. You need to understand the, the guidelines before you go into any situation like that. And that's not only, you know, financially, physically, mentally, what is your expectation out of that experience? And it should never be, well, I'm, that experience is going to give me this. So that person's going to give me this. It's no, what am I going to learn from that experience? And that was kind of where that piece of advice was like, no, I shouldn't expect anything out of this. I think that this is a good idea. You know, I'm going to go to this audition because I think that I'm good enough. I think that I'll learn this process. I, you know, I'll get to meet people who are in the community. It's not that, you know, I'm going to get this role and I'm going to blow up and be the next, uh, you know, Nicholas Cage. 
That's, that's not how those things work. <laughs> to your point, if you think that you're good enough, then show up. Audition. Do it. Yeah. Manifest. Well, thank you for sharing your story with me today. Yeah, thank you for having me. This was awesome. Thank you for listening to The Cost of the Status Quo and learning the wisdom, stories, and ideas that will have you feeling inspired and ready to take on the world. If you've enjoyed this, please remember to share, rate, and review. It means the world to me and the team putting it all together. If you're looking for more information, you can find us at costofthestatusquo.com or on Instagram at costofthestatusquo. If you've got any questions or curiosity about me, you can find me at lindsaylearner.com. That's L-I-N-D-S-E-Y-L-E-R-N-E-R.com or on Instagram at lindsaylearner. Thanks again for listening. Hope you have an awesome day.